I'm Lynn Pulsiver, president of the Kentville Historical Society. And uh, this is our first speaker meeting of 2024. And we're looking forward to another busy year. For those of you who haven't been to any of our meetings, I'll just do a little rundown here for you. So um, before the formal introduction of our speaker tonight, and for those people who haven't been here, um, I'll just give you a few few plans for the upcoming year. So our background is our, oops, our society is now seven years old. It was back in 2017 that the Kentville Historical Society was formed by a passionate group of seven people. I was one of them. <laughs> Brian was one of them. And Louis was one of them. So we have a few original members here. We started with a $100 donation and um, the society was, society was formed, and it was to preserve and um, present, display the heritage and history of Kentville. So it's been seven years since we've been doing this job, and I think we've done a fantastic job, actually. We um, acquired the use of the former radio station, drifting away from this, um, which is over on Station Lane. So if you, if you haven't been or don't know about this being over there, we'll be opening again in May. So uh, we hope to see some of the faces that are here. So a few of the events that are coming up, I'll just do a quick rundown. Um, Heritage Day on February the 19th. And our Heritage Center will be open that day. That's a Monday from 1 to 4. And we have two local historians. Uh, Louis Camel, sitting over there, and Ed Coleman, who isn't here tonight, will be there for that time that we're open uh, to talk about Kentville's history and to answer any questions and conversation with them. They know lots, so if you have any questions, they're the people to ask. So we'll be, we'll be there from 1 to 4, and we'll have some refreshments and coffee, so it'll be a nice way to celebrate Heritage Day in Kentville. Our next speaker meeting will be Thursday, March the 21st. And um, our speaker for that night will be Fred Huntley. And he will be talking to us about the history of the original, the old Dominion Atlantic Kentville Railway Station. Uh, he's just finished uh, a miniature model to scale says of the former station and uh, hopefully he will bring it with him so um, I'm sure that will be very interesting. Fred's a member of the Middleton um, Historical Society, the Railway Society down in Middleton and they've done some great work down there so anyway uh, I guess that's about all I will mention about upcoming events. We do have our 2024 calendars here tonight and they're yeah, on the back, t on the front table, but here's the front page. The front page is in black and white, but the interior is all colored. So um, it's, it's a great calendar. It's, um, it's on the uh, historical business calendars of Kentville, some dating back as far as 1917. So uh, each page will have picture of the calendar and uh, relevant history or maybe a little receipts or things that will pictures of, of the business itself. So it's got quite a bit of information in it and uh, they're for selling now for $15. We've reduced the price and uh, you know there are major fundraisers so you know we use the proceeds from the calendars to really operate our center. We also have railway t-shirts back there that um, are still avail available and we will sell them once uh, we get an order and probably won't be till spring. So, but they've been really popular. There's the Dayliner design, there's the Dominion Atlantic Railway logo design and uh, different colors. And, and I think we sold about a hundred of those since the fall. So they've been, they've been doing well. Uh, also, uh, we're quite excited to say that uh, we recently started our own YouTube 
channel and our page. I don't know what to call it, channel maybe, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's entitled the Penn Film Historical Society. And uh, this is a new initiative for us, and thanks to our grandson, Aaron Holster, who's right there, um, he helped us get that going and load it up because we're all so old, we don't know how to do these things, and we need to have the, um, the younger brains that work well for that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, we're going to be video videoing this tonight, and it'll be on our YouTube channel in a couple days. So. Uh, you know, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, okay. Um, oh, also, membership. If anyone wishes to join our society, at the, at the table there, Pam looks after membership and she'll take your money and sign you up. You don't have to do anything for us. You just come to the meetings and uh, we'd like to have a, a membership list that says, we already have 73 members, so that's not bad. Uh, okay, um, now that's it for me, and um, I'm going to welcome David Duke to come up and introduce our guest speaker. David's one of our members and a huge supporter of our society, and he has helped us out greatly from day one when we first started. So, anyway, David, thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, as many of you know, I'm, I'm uh, the Dean of Arts at Acadia, and so I'm very delighted to welcome and introduce uh, a colleague and very good friend, uh, Wendy Robichaud, uh, to present to us tonight. Wendy is Acadia University's archivist and an instructor in the Department of History and Classics, and I'll have more to say about that in a second. But I would like to begin by noting that Wendy's background is as a historian. Uh, she studied history as an undergraduate at Mount Allison University, specializing in Atlantic Canadian studies, history, and anthropology. And she followed this with a diploma um, in um, library technology at Nova Scotia Community College, with a specialization in archives management, and then followed that with an MA in Atlantic Canadian studies. And since 2005, Wendy's been a leading member of the Acadia University Library and Archives team, and has been a leading exponent of archival studies as teaching tools for students, not only in the arts, but across campus. She's developed a very popular course, uh, Unlocking the Archival Record, which uses the extensive collections uh, held by Acadia to expand students' awareness of the importance, and I must say this, even more importantly, the pleasure of archival research. The course has become one of the most sought after among senior history students and others besides and forms a key element of the material culture program that's within the Department of History and Classics. Now bringing this a little bit closer to tonight, um, beginning in the early 2000s, or excuse me, the early 2010s, Wendy's research and teaching activities turned to the then upcoming centenary events that were being planned for the commemoration of the First World War. And she was interested in looking at the general commemoration and the people that were involved 100 years ago, Canada's role in the conflict, and Acadia's role as a contributor to Canada's role as well. And since her research began in this area, she supported several uh, student partner leaders in the project and has led literally hundreds of other students as they volunteered to assist in the research and dissemination of the project's results through her Adopt a Soldier program. Wendy also offers the project's findings to a wider audience through her YouTube channel, and don't forget this, it's called Poppy War Boys. Poppy War Boys. I strongly encourage you to have a look at it, um, because that, that YouTube channel includes a great deal of, re of her research on the First World War, but also lots of tips and tricks about genealogical research, effective use of the archives, and so on. It contains, as I say, a lot of information and, like Wendy, is also a complete hoot. This evening, Wendy will be talking to us about her projects related to Soldiers of the Queen and bringing us into her world of passionate, active history, one in which the present is deeply connected to the past, where young people in their late teens and early 20s are invited to explore the lives and sacrifices of other young people in their late teens and early 20s more than a century ago. I will say as a historian myself that this kind of history, 
participatory history is an immensely effective, meaningful, and powerful form of history, both for our students and for their audiences, because when he insists that their work must be publicized and disseminated to a wider audience, and when he is going to advance that work tonight as she presents on Soldiers of the Queen, please join me in welcoming Wendy and her presentation. only just the right amount. I always appreciate that. Um, as I was sitting there, I was reminded of something that happened to me uh, in 1994 or so, just before I was to speak to a large group of archivists. I was a very, very young archivist at the time, and it was one of those monumental moments where your mind goes completely blank and you have absolutely no idea what you're going to say before you get in front of a group of people and think, I have, what are they going to think of me? I have no idea what I'm going to say. Why is that relevant? Hence this slide. Right? This slide is the, oh, right, this will bring me back down to earth, give me a chance to always include a slide like this that says, oh, right, this is me, and this is what I do. So yes, I'm an archivist, and I do First World War research the First World War research kept bringing me back to the South African War. I'm not going to call it the Boer War, because at the time they called it the South African War. So I'm going to refer to it that way. So First World War kept bringing me back into the South African War. But there's a strange connection here that I really have to look into. Some rainy day down the road, I'm going to do that. Six months ago, Ed Coleman saw me. And he said, you should come and speak to the Historical Society. And I thought, this is a great time to force me to look at the South African War. And so this is why I'm here tonight. It really has forced me to do that. The other thing, of course, is I love to talk about the boys. Generally the boys. I mean, there were women involved in a lot of the research, but there are so few nurses about whom I can find really solid, excellent information that I only have you know, anecdotal information about them. But the boys, I can find really solid, great information about them. So most of the stories that I tell are about the men who were involved in both of these wars. And we're going to find that tonight is that overlap between those two. So that's why I always have this slide at the beginning. Now, I don't have, you know, those, uh, is it, uh, it's Inspector Gadget. You remember the Go-Go Gadget arms? I don't have those, so we'll have to just um, have me walk back and forth as I sort of go between all of this. Tonight, as we know, we're talking about soldiers of the queen, not of the king, who I usually look at, Second World, or First World War. Tonight, we're going to look at the soldiers of the queen. If you didn't know already, spoiler alert, mm -hmm. there was a war in 1899. I suspect you knew that already. Now, when that war came in 1899, it was no surprise to our families either. Because the political powers had been positioning themselves for this war for a number of years. Now, my own research, as you've all been told, is not about that political posture. It's not about those empire builders. It's about the impact of those decisions made on people in rooms just like this. Our, our own ancestors who sat in these rooms 100 years ago, I like to know how they responded. What were their conversations about? And I try to find the personal stories of the men and the women who were directly impacted by those decisions made in foreign capital cities. So tonight, what we're going to do, we're going to turn our attention to a practically forgotten war that's basically overshadowed by many others. And this, this war starts with a number of uh, a political posturing that starts in the late 1800s. Really. But the impact of the people that I researched is not felt until 1899. I found this lovely poster 
there's all these fun posters that are always out there about uh, recruitment and so on. First of all, one, world ones, world war ones are really fun. This is a really great one um, from the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. Canada raises a force of men to send to South Africa. They are men willing to fight for Mother Britain. Hmm. Now, because it is a fairly unknown war in many cases, let's just get a little bit of context, just a little bit before we progress. Here's Canada. In and around 1899. Yeah, I didn't ask for permission to grab this, I just grabbed it. <coughs> Now remember, in 1899, we are a young country, and we are not really proven on the battlefield. In fact, I'd say we're not proven at all. We've had a small skirmish there in 18, uh, 1812, 1814, it was a small skirmish. In 1812, you might remember it, something about the White House side. We had a few minor uprisings, really, in the you know, upper, upper and lower Canada, which is what that was all about. Um, but Canada hasn't really fought for anything. And this is my opinion only, but independence was given to Canada by a crown that divested itself of us in 1867. We didn't fight for that like they did so before. So our militia is really a patchwork of regiments spread throughout those regions, and we're really there for a, a form of home defense. Now to support all of that, I decided I needed to go out and have a look at this. This is the report in 1899 for the Militia and Defense. Have a look at our numbers. Hopefully that's not too blurry to read. Have a, but look at this. Our, our population around 1900 is 5 million people. Okay. Look at the militia numbers, right? And I, I did a little bit of math. I'm really bad at math. Okay? Numbers to me are always dates, they're not math. But, you know, I did a little bit of math and 1.8% of the population seemed about right. So I'm going to go with that number and stick with it. Okay, that's how big the militia is. It's nothing. Now, I can emphasize that point yet again by turning further in to that report. Remember, I'm used to First World War. In the First World War, these reports, they're like page one, lots of stuff, everything's going on, flashy, dancing women, the whole works, right? Which I find a little bit about South Africa in a couple of paragraphs in the 1899 report on page 26. So it doesn't show up until page 26 before they start to talk about what happens with the Canadian contingent. And here's, you know, basically what they say in a couple of paragraphs. We've got an infantry battalion. There are eight companies of infantry only. They enlist for six months and they have the option to extend for one year. And they enlist in Quebec, meaning Quebec City, and then it opens in Ottawa, Kingston, Ontario, and then Montreal. Here's a look at that battalion and what it looks like. That first Canadian contingent, now we know it was the first one, but then it was only the Canadian contingent, was just over 1,000 individuals strong. And seven horses, by the way. So it's not even a mounted regiment, it's not mounted rifles or any of that. Those seven horses are probably their dragon wagons. Right? So nobody's riding them, they're probably dragging around legs, maybe a cannon or two and so on. That 1,000 men was raised in four days. Just four days. And they mobilized that afternoon. They got on the ship and they sailed away that afternoon. Think of how well trained they were. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty bad. It really is. <laughs> so yeah, this is the first Canadian contingent. Uh, contingent. There will be other contingents. and. You know, I need to know a lot more about these men in particular, and I want to know about the ones that came from Acadia specifically. 
there's a nominal role in that report, by the way. So if you're cu curious about who those fellows are, they're easy to find. So to find out a little bit more about the Maritimers that are involved, I turn to this book, <coughs> Everyday Life of the RCR, being the Royal Canadian Regiment. It's published in 1901 by Russell Hughes. And he fills in a couple of good blanks for us. So it's not all about Upper and Lower Canada now. This guy is from the Maritimes. He's from St. John. And he tells us that in, uh, in October of 1899, there was recruitment going on in St. John as well. So that larger report doesn't mention us uh, in the Maritimes at all. This fellow tells us it happens in St. John. And he also tells us that they sail from Quebec. So the, the fellows that are here in the Maritimes have to get, they load them on the train, like cattle essentially, and then they ship them off to Quebec and they join the rest of the, the uh, contingent. They sail on October the 29th and they arrive on November the 29th. And now we know it's a one month voyage. And he describes that voyage in great detail. A really interesting read, you know, if you have a strong sound. <clears throat> The contingent was in Africa for 11 months. So they signed up for six, but they really got all out. And that they were, he talk, describes a lot about how they were invalided out of Africa with rheumatism, fever, and other sicknesses. And they were sent out of Africa back to England. So they weren't sent back to Canada, they were shipped to England first. So now we have a lot more things to work with. This is a really great read. It's only about 100 pages. You can read it in an hour or two, really interesting, about specifically his ideas of what happened in the RCR for his 11 months. Ah, then I turned to the Canadians and Karki. And I found out this. So this will tell you about um, all of the various contingents that went, how many were there, how many horses there were, really important. And we see that it's not really until much later that we have the mounted regiments that go over. So they're sending infantry first, and then later on they send over um, the mountain regiments. Really quite different than the First World War. Quite fascinating to see how this happens. So while these sources provide us with context and recall specific events, they do not acquaint us with the men who are there on the ground. <coughs> and it's their stories that we're really interested in. We want to know who these men are, how this war impacts them. What happens to these poor fellows? And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to meet some of those local veterans who were in the South African War. And some of the people here tonight have volunteered to represent those forgotten members of our own community. I hope you fellows are ready. First of all, I'd like to know if Mr. Gordon is in the room. Mr. Gordon, are you here? You can tell us your story, please. My name is Harold Gordon, for Canning. You may know my father, the Honorable Dr. Frederick W. Gordon, who is Minister of Militia. I am a major in the Kings County Hussars. While taking a medical course at McGill College, I accepted a position as lieutenant in the PE squadron with the 2nd Canadian Contingent in January of 1900. In May of 1900, Gordon swam the Zand River at the head of his troops at a displaced uh, a party of fours. While engaging the enemy on the 16th of June 1900, was shot through the heart and crying, Boys, I'm done for! And dropped dead. While Gordon's story is the easiest to find in most of the records, any information that I have from here on in is sketchy at best. It's mostly by chance that I've been able to find these men, and sometimes these guys find me. For example, back in November, I visited the memorial area set up in Fort Williams. You know the area I mean up by the, um, the fire hall. And two soldiers came and found me that day. I wasn't looking for them, but here they found me. The first one was Private Comden. Is Private Comden here? 
Is Mr. Lockwood in the room? Hi, I'm Arthur Lockwood, a carriage builder from Fort William. I have been serving with the 68th Kings County Regiment for a few years, so I enlisted with the 1st Contingent. I was wounded in 2000, invalided to a hospital in England. My Queen's Medal has one class for Cape Colony. Thank you, Mr. Lockwood. Lockwood was discharged in Halifax on the 31st of August in 1900. Now, you remember how Lockwood found me at, Port well, at the Port William Cenotaph back in November. Well, here's the irony of it all, and this happens frequently. In late December, Lockwood just showed up in front of me in the student newspaper as a special student taking courses at Horton Academy in 1902-1903. They just find him once in a while. I don't know how. And he's not alone. More students from Acadia and their affiliates have been identified using sources that we found in the archives and the special collections. What about Mr. Durkee? Is Mr. Durkee here? My name is Adelbert Durkee. I come from Pleasant Valley in Yarmouth County. I'm a machinist and 22 years old. Because of my militia experience with the 3rd Victorian Rifles, I enlisted in Montreal in 1899 with the Royal Canadian Regiment. When I was discharged in November 1900, I was awarded the Queen's Medals with three clasps for Johannesburg, Cape Colony, and Orange Free State. Thank you, Mr. Durkee. Now, Durkee has proven to be elusive at best. Here's what I've been able to piece together. Durkee attended Horton Academy, but I can't get the exact years because we don't have class lists dated before 1900. He also may have only attended for a term, or he could have been a special student, a uh, special student, because these students cannot be found in photographs. So every avenue I take, can't find the guy. There's also evidence that he was in the First World War. In fact, just today I was looking and he is a major in the First World War. Regardless, we now know he's also in South Africa. Mr. Daniels, are you here? I am. I am Brad Daniels. I was born in Paradise, Nova Scotia in 1871. I graduated from Horton Academy with the class of 1892 and have a BA from Acadia University with the class of 1894. I also have an MA from Harvard. After seeing active service in the Transvaal as a member of the first Canadian contingent, I returned home and married Oli B. Burgess in 1900. My life's work was journalism and writing. Thank you. Now, a source that we have in Acadia called the Acadia Record, fantastic little source, gives tidy biographies of uh, as many of the graduating students and some of the other students between 1838 and about 1953. I use it constantly. And Daniel shows up in there. And it says, this really interesting paragraph. Here's what it says. Represented American papers as correspondent in the Philippine Islands 
China, Japan, and South Africa. Now, why is that interesting? Because Winston Churchill is also a foreign correspondent in South Africa. And I'm like, did these two guys cross paths? Do they know each other? Like, a fellow here from Acadia might have crossed paths with Winston Churchill. Okay, also says, I got really excited about the make this good. <laughs> also says, for a time, Daniels was a professor in English at a college in Washington, engaged in magazine and newspaper work, retired to a wet ranch in Washington State where he developed a large cherry orchard, and he's the author of two books called The Outer Edge and Jacob's Letter. He also published a number of articles in the Atlantic Monthly, so we can find them pretty darn easy, and the Canadian Magazine. It should be easy to find examples of his writing, but I haven't followed it. I'm looking for Mr. McAvoy. Are you in the room? My name is Francis McAvoy, and I was born in Scotland in 1884. During the South African War, I saw active service as a bugler in the 3rd Battalion of Highland Light Infantry. My Acadia yearbook proclaims that my musical skills are shown by the fact that I was twice leader of the Acadia College Band. I graduated from the Horton Collegiate Academy and hold a Bachelor in Theology from Acadia University's class of 1919 and a BA from Acadia University's class of 1920. I also have an MA from the People's National University class of 1923 and a DD from Linear University. For a time, I worked with the Salvation Army I've held Baptist pastorates in New Minas, Edinburgh, Ellsworth, and Glace Bay. Thank you, Mr. Beck. I want to go back to that Acadia record, that little book that tells me all those biographies, and it indicates that McAvoy changed his denominational connection and went outside the Baptist Convention of the Maritime Provinces in 1926. A big no-no <laughs> for Acadia in 26, I can tell you that. Um, he died in the Nanaimo, British Columbia in 1915. Mr. Arnell, are you in the room? I am Jesse Arnell, born in 1881 in England. I was an infantryman serving with the Essex Regiment for many years, including in South Africa. I was awarded the Queen's Medal with four bars. After coming to Canada, I joined the Royal Canadian Regiment in 1911. In 1914, I enlisted with the Canadian Ordnance Corps in Halifax. Thank you, Mr. Arnell. I found Arnell, he attended Acadia in 1919, and he was probably attracted to the university by Dr. Cutton, the AR president at the time, Dr. Cutton's offer of one free year of tuition to any returned soldiers. But after 1919, he just disappears. And that's one of the things that I've found with a lot of the fellows from the First World War. They come for that free year, and then for a whole host of reasons that we're not going to get into, but you can imagine what the amount of challenges that, they're, that they had coming back to university. Um, it's something I'm going to write about for a month's about it now. Um, he just disappears in so many others. I did a great deal of digging, but I found him living in Hansport sometime after the war, and I did find that he dies in 1927. So Mr. Arnell does stay in the area. I want to tell you about Mr. Mercero. And I'm going to tell you about Mr. Mercero myself, because he has an impact on me personally. I'm going to call him Jack, because he's one of the guys who has had, a, had an impact. Jack has a BA yeah, in 1900 from Acadia, and he wrote a graduation uh, essay and presented it. The essay is called The Value of the General Education to the Military Man. That so tells you about the types of things that were being discussed on campus in 1900. So the war was in their mind. It's one of the articles I'm writing up right now. Jack has an MA with the class of 1903 from Acadia, and uh, MA also from Harvard, 1908. He's born in Bathurst, uh, New Brunswick, 1880. Now he marries a woman named Carabella Wilton in 1905. 
And I keep wondering whether or not she's from Welton Hall that was on campus. Because Welton Hall would have been there. It's not there anymore. But it would have been there in 1905. I think probably she's, she's from Welton Sources indicate that Jack was the adjutant of the Royal Canadian Regiment, served in South Africa in 1901, but I can't prove it. I have inklings, but I can't prove it. When he comes back, if indeed he does come back from South Africa, he's a principal in Bathurst, in Chatham, and then he comes back to this area. He's the housemaster at Horton, Horton Academy, which is where I think he meets up with Carabella. He's the principal at Horton Academy, and then they go back to Chatham. Uh, and he's there. He goes into life insurance for a little while. And here's where I think he is the other bit that makes me think he was in the South African War because he's a brigade major with the 4th uh, Canadian Light Infantry Brigade in 1914 and 1915. And usually if you, are re if you have returned or had some experience, often a lot of experience, with the South African War, you end up being an officer, a senior officer in the First World War. So, it looks probably pretty good, but the records just aren't there to support specifically. Um, the reason why I'm a little bit attached to him because he was flagged for me uh, badly, badly wounded. wounded. Um, he has a horrific war experience. Keeps on trucking though, he keeps coming back. He stayed for the full time, was awarded DSO in 19, and spent the rest of his life doing uh, life insurance, oddly enough. <laughs> As, Many of the boys seem to do when they come back. Really, really odd some of their uh, choices. And he stays with the military. He's appointed to colonel uh, with the 16th Infantry Brigade uh, in 1924. Dies in 1942. That's one of those really interesting stories I've stayed with for the first world. Mr. McLeod, are you here? My name is Norman McLeod. I'm from New Brunswick. I attended Acadia as a general student between 1895 and 1897, but did not graduate. When I was 22, I enlisted as a gunner in the Royal Field Artillery. I had previous military militia experience with the 71st New Brunswick Regiment. I was discharged in 1901 and awarded the Queen's Medals with three class for the Cape Colony, Orange Free Strait, and Cut Thank you, Mr. I did find Mr. McLeod also in the First World War. He serves as an officer with the siege battery, and he was decorated with a uh, military cross, and he was mentioned in this place. You see how the two keep overlapping, and this is why I'm so interested in them both together. Mr. Jones, are you here, sir? Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm Horace Jones from Wolfville. I graduated from Horton Collegiate Academy in 1898 and attended Acadia. I expected to graduate University in 1902, but the war changed my plans. Along with my brother Stan, I enlisted in the Royal Canadian Regiment with the first contingent. I was just 22 years old, but I had experience with the militia, having been part of the 68th Kings County Regiment. When I was discharged in 19 January 1901, I had enteric fee or typhoid. For my service, I was awarded the Queen's Medals with four class for Pel Perdenburg, Bryfontaine, Johannesburg, and Cape Colony. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Jones's 1898 graduation essay was entitled Anti British Feeling in the United States. <laughs> Maybe he should have called it about anti-British feeling in South Africa would have been much more on, on the I already knew about Boris because he and my brother are the real reason why, he and his brother are the real reason why South Africa kept coming up. They spawned this research and this interest. I know that Horace uh, joined the CEF, uh, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, as a sapper with the railway troops. He transfers back into uh, the Royal Canadian Regiment. He was wounded in October of 1917, Passchendaele, and he receives the Military Medal. Now, as affectionate as I feel for Horace, it's his brother. And I'm going to tell you about his brother. 
Um, in the past, I've not been able to do it without crying. I went to go see Stanley when I was overseas in 16, 2016. We won't get there this time. We're going back in a few months, but uh, we won't get to see Stanley this time. Yeah. Stanley, let me tell you about him. He's got a BA he's with the class of 1897. His graduation essay was about commercial crises, so he's not interested in war. That's not his thing. Also born in Wolfville, he's older than his brother. He's born in 1878. And as soon as he graduates, he goes to Manitoba. And he teaches for a couple of years. And he enlists in Manitoba. He's with that first contingent because he enlists in October of 1899, and he's only 23 years old. He's a baby, essentially. He had military training with the 68th Kings County Regiment, and that's one of the interesting things that I've been able to do with the First World War research, is track who's with the Kings County Hussars, and who's with the 68th, and who's with the KDS COTC. So now I have nominal roles for those where they don't seem to exist elsewhere. Um, so Private Jones for South Africa, he, uh, he, does, he joins the, another infantry uh, regiment, the 5th Regiment, and then he transfers into the RCR with his brother in about 1900. In June of 1900, he's promoted to Lance Corporal, and he's discharged on the 25th of December, 1900. I doubt that. I argue with that uh, because I know that he's in Wolfville for Christmas in 1900. I have evidence of it. I know that he's there. Uh, he spends Christmas, so he might he must have been discharged in Halifax as opposed to in, in England. He has the Queen's Medals with four class for Paraguay, Dreyfontein, Johannesburg, and the Cape Colony. So he was in a lot of, he was in it. As soon like as even before the New Year, uh, 1901, he heads back out west. He's a law student in Calgary, and then he goes straight into practice for the rest uh, until the First World War. Signs up in Calgary, joins the Canadian Army, he actually uh, goes into the PCLI, so he's in the Princess Pass, and he goes overseas. His First World War story is terrible. He has terrible experiences over there. Um, and, um, and he's wounded at Mount Sol, and we were there as well. An uh, awful experience. And he dies in Belgium. He's one of my only boys. I had uh, six or eight boys taken prisoner. Um, Stan was the only one who died while in the prison camp, in the German prison camp, um, from his wounds. They, I don't blame the Germans. They tried to save him. They did. Yeah, he was beyond hope. There's a school in Calgary named after him. When I go to Calgary, uh, the last time I went to this school, I've been to this school. <laughs> you get attached to these people after a while, more so than you really should. But there are some of them that just kind of hit you. Let's talk sources for a minute. Um, Acadia's archives of special collections, but especially in special collections, we have more sources than I expected to find. Right? So. Uh, I consulted a lot of these because they're local sources. They're about maritimers and maritime experiences. And some of them are, you know, that very generic, like the generic, the fancy, lofty, we were so great, we did great things, look at us, blah, blah, blah. Well, you always get those. But some of them are very down to earth. Uh, it, this was my experience. This was what I, I saw. Uh, and and they're, they're in special collections as well, but I, I consulted all of these. They're there for anybody to read, make an appointment, come on in. We'd love for you to read them. But then, you know, um, it was a friend of mine who's sitting in the room who happened to mention a couple of weeks ago, well, you know, maybe we need a little bit more context to the war war. And I thought about that for a bit, and I, mm -hmm. I'm only going to point you to some places that I found some more context. And you get that snapshot without going to Wikipedia. And, you know, the Canadian Encyclopedia is fantastic to give you this really great bing bang boom snapshot um, in, in 20 seconds or less with, you know, maps. <laughs> so if you need to know where the Transvaal is, there it is. Like, it, it's really good for that. Um, so I highly recommend that read. 
I, this too, um, this is the, the Canadian War Veteran site with a timeline down the side, and that's what I wanted. There's a timeline so you can really get a sense of what um, the War Veteran site, and they have personal stories there too. Really great spot. This is what really caught my eye. Here we go. These. Right? We kept talking about the Queen's Medal and how many class. Here they are. Right? Here's the class. Super important. Now you have a good sense of what that what what we were talking about with those class for and what they had for the Queen's Medal. Super important to uh, to get that understanding. And that's on the veterans uh, website. Okay. I am remiss. unless I get to this slide, which says, there's more stuff to talk about, and somebody should pick up this sword and run with it. Here's some things that I uh, that I sort of thought about. If a student came to me, and they probably should, to say, what else could I possibly do some research on? And I'm really excited about uh, the war, war, the South African war. What can I do some research on? Here's my recommendations. There are so many links between South African War and World War I, I think that needs to be teased out so much more. Um, somebody needs to spend some time on it. It might be me, if I have another lifetime, I might get to it. <laughs> Maybe. Um, the militia numbers, 1899 to 1901, and 1914 to 1919, I think it would be really interesting to look at those numbers and understand how Canada grows its military. There's something really interesting in that. The King's County Hussars and the 68th Regiment, I, there's something there too that really needs to be teased out and understood as to how this specific area responds to, um, to the military itself. But more so, I don't think we can ever tell enough stories about our local soldiers. I think we need to tell the stories, put them in context, and help everyone understand how our own our, our, our own, period, our own, our own uh, in defense of this country during times of war. Now, while I was reading those books in special collections, I came across this. And I can't tell you whether I was incised or just shocked when I read this. Here's the problem. If you haven't spotted it already, here's the problem. It's this last paragraph. This paragraph, wow. Okay, we started with empire building, right? And I think we should end on that. This paragraph says to me something that is happening right now. It's this way of thinking that not only started like that entire century, but set that entire century, and we're still feeling the effects of that type of sentiment, right? This is what impacts people for over a century. And, I, and when I read it, I think that's what really got me. I think it was raging in Palestine at that particular moment, as it still is, and really got me. Okay.